Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Fabio Rambelli. I am a professor of Japanese religions and cultural history at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And it is a great pleasure for me to be here today with you to talk about um, the sh Grand Shrine of Munakata, its deities, and uh, a, you know a broader context um, uh, in terms of the sea and uh, religiosity in uh, in Japanese history. Um, I work on the history of Japanese religions, especially the relationships between Buddhism and Shinto or local cults, uh, especially in pre-modern times like um, Middle Ages or um, Edo period. Oh, and, and of course, I'm also interested in, in modern and contemporary Japan. I go to Japan and I like it very much. So it's, it's not that I live in the Middle Ages. But but a lot of very interesting things happened in Japan in the Middle Ages and in the Tokugawa period, and that is what interests me. In addition to the sea and religion, I'm also interested in the role of material objects in, uh, in Japanese religions. Uh, especially here in America, a lot of people uh, think about Japanese religion in terms of spirituality, you know, spirits, beliefs, prayers, but a lot of Japanese religion is really about uh, using objects, you know, like the butsudan, uh, going to a temple, buying uh, omamori, and, and doing things with that. And again, not only Japanese religions is like that. A lot of other religions do use objects for, for religious purposes, right, to communicate with, uh, with the gods, with the ancestors, with spirits and all that. So Japan is not an exception. But to me, it's very interesting to see how these objects were made and how these objects were conceived, were thought of. So I'm really interested in kind of thought processes, you know, like the intellectual history behind, behind what people do and behind what people, how people live. Another interest of mine, and then I'll stop here because I have something else to say. Another interest of mine is really um, uh, ceremonial music in Japan, gagaku. And the role of Gagaku in uh, not only at the imperial court, you know, in the imperial palace, but also at Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines uh, throughout Japanese history. I'm also a player of the show myself. I play the, the instrument and, um, and, and it's a beautiful instrument and Gagaku is a beautiful kind of music. So anyway, here I am and uh, thank you for, uh, for listening to me and I'm ready to start my presentation. So uh, here I am with, uh, so this is the title of my presentation is Munakata and the Sea in Japanese Religions. And I use the plural because that's what we do here, you know, religions, because there's Buddhism, there's Shinto, there are other systems of beliefs. So we like to think of it in a, in a, broader, in a broader sense. Also, when I talk about religion, I know that many Japanese feel uncomfortable. People feel uncomfortable when people talk about shukyo because they think I'm, you know, mushukyo des. You know that that's the the usual answer that they give. So here, religion is really conceived in a, in a very broad sense in terms of like shinko, in terms of like general attitudes towards the kami, towards the Buddhas, towards the senzo sama. It's not really. I don't mean any particular membership in any specific religious organization. So, so this is how I use it. And uh, in the PowerPoint later on in the presentation, I may talk about cults. Now in English, cults uh, in this particular context refers not to like strange new religions doing like strange things. Cults is really like worship. It's really, in Japanese, it's really like Shinko, what people do towards the sacred, towards the divine. So I don't mean it in any negative way at all. I mean, this is like a technical term that refers, it's a word that comes from Latin, by the way. It's really worship of the of the gods in ancient Rome. And this is how it's still used in, uh, in English. Okay, so let me begin uh, with my uh, presentation. So, um, the, the beginning of my, so the reason I started working on the sea and 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 sea goddesses or gods, and uh, and Munakata Taisha in particular, is because I noticed that you know working on again the history of Japanese religions, I noticed that there is a certain lack of interest for the role of the sea in Japanese religions. Um, many people, many scholars, you know, many many teachers of mine focus on mountains 
as the specific sites of the of the gods right of the of the spirits of ancestors so here i mean like uh, you know shugendo uh, the role of yamabushi in japanese culture uh, but again so the focus on the mountain has taken away interest from the sea which again i think is kind of interesting uh, and 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 they become curious you know as to why that has happened another focus that many many people and many scholars have is really agriculture and especially rice and the symbolism associated with agriculture. Again, not so much fishing, for example. Um, this is particularly evident in the, in the ritual calendar of uh, Shinto shrines, for example, which is pretty much based on the agricultural cycle. So like in, in the spring, you have uh, omatsuri, you have rituals. And then in the fall, after the harvest, you have other rituals. But um, if you live in a coastal community and you are, you know, in a, in a fishing village, the agricultural cycle is probably not that important because, again, fishers depend on the cycle of the fish, not on the cycle of the rice. And, and so, um, again, this is another interesting uh, thing to me to see why that happened. So overall, I think that there has been a certain marginalization, if you can call it this way, of coastal areas, a marginalization that is economic, um, because a lot of fishing villages are not really prosperous in Japan today. It is the big cities that, you know, where, where the wealth accumulates, not, not so much in fishing villages. But again, it was different in the Edo period. Fishing villages were very prosperous uh, at the time. A marginalization that is social, because again, Big cities, like big factories, big companies have, you know, have the preeminence and little businesses like in the fishing villages in the countryside are kind of minor and marginal. Marginalization that is political and is also symbolic, like I said, because again, the symbolism is focused on the mountains, on the cities and on agriculture. And also another factor, um, but before I get to that, let me say uh, another couple of things that are not here in the slide. So. I was born in, in Italy, in a place called Ravenna, is near the Adriatic coast, is near the coast. And um, there are some clear days where when you are at the beach and you can see the mountains from there, which are like 50 kilometers away, but you can still even more, but you can see the mountains from the beach, which is kind of interesting. I studied, I studied Japanese studies in Venice. Venice is in the middle of the sea, as you know, right? But again, in some clear days, like very beautiful days with a beautiful sky, you can see the Alps from there, which is quite amazing. You know, you are in the middle of the sea and you see the, the mountains right, right, right there, at the, uh, you know, like at the, on the horizon. And uh, now I live here in Santa Barbara in California, which is a, is a beautiful town between the mountains and the, and the beach and the sea, pretty much like Fukuoka, by the way. And so, um, so I'm aware, you know, throughout all my life, I've been aware that there is a close connection somehow between mountains and sea. And sometimes it's hard to talk about one without the other. But on the other hand, my, my passion, let's see, has been, you know, towards the sea and not so much towards the mountain. So this also kind of explains uh, this particular interest of mine and the reason why I'm talking about this particular uh, topic today. Now, to point number five, you know, the vast changes in the Japanese landscape since the Edo period. If you live in Japan, you probably don't notice it. But, um, for example, Tokyo during the Edo period was pretty much like Venice, it was a city on the sea. It was, it was on, on the coast, there was a beach, there were a lot of canals and rivers inside, inside the city. A lot of transportation took place, not by Shinkansen, of course, or by trucks, by through boats. And uh, if you go to Tokyo now, it's very hard to find the beach. It's a probably a little one in Odaiba, I guess, <laughs> which is artificial. And uh, pretty much every, everything else has been built up and a lot of rivers and canals have been covered by concrete. Uh, same for Osaka. Osaka was a major, uh, you know, place by the coast, by the beach, while Osaka still is. But there is no beach in Osaka. There is a huge port with highways, with airports, with, uh, with concrete. But the beach is very hard to find there. So this is a huge change in landscape that has happened in, uh, in, in, in Japan over the last two or 300 years. It's something that starts in the Edo period with the reclamation of land 
to have more agricultural land so they they took away parts of the sea and they and they made the new 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 lands and for example in fukuoka hakozaki hajimangu in the edo period was famous for the for the pines you know like like on the beach if you go there to hakozaki now there is no beach there the beach is what two kilometers away and and so you say what happened here right so, for example, in the next slide, this is Sumiyoshi uh, Taisha Grand, Grand Shrine in Osaka, and uh, this is where it is today. Now, if you look at the map from the Edo period here on the right, you see that the main complex of Akozaki Taisha is here, but it's just a short walk to the beach, which is here. And from the shrine, you know, you have all the pine trees, you have the sand, you have the beach, and then you have the sea. Uh, so that's what people had in mind when, uh, you know, until the Edo period, they went to Sumiyoshi Taisha to pray for like, you know, fishing, for, for seafaring and all that. If you go to Sumiyoshi Taisha now, <laughs> this, I mean, it's like in the middle of the city, there's, there's no sea there. So this kind of, ju just to make my point that many things have changed so much in Japan, not only in terms of symbolism, not, terms, not only in terms of culture, but also in terms of geography and, and environment. And so what was close to the sea at this time in the Edo period or before now uh, has no connection whatsoever with the sea. So that uh, has also changed, I think, the attitudes of many people towards these sacred places and towards the gods. Um, in a way that uh, it's very hard to tell, but it's possible that, you know, uh, again, uh, has contributed to the to the marginalization of the of the sea and its culture, like I mentioned a moment ago. Um, another question that I had, you know, in my, in, you know, when I was working on this, um, on this topic is, um, is this, you know, why are there no major Buddhist temples built by the by the by the beach? You know, all the major Buddhist temples, right? Todaiji is in the middle of Nara, Kofukuji is in the middle of Nara, Toji is, well, it's near Kyoto Station, but, you know, uh, Nishi Honganji is in the middle of Kyoto. Um, all these other temples are in, you know, in, in the center of big cities or on the mountains, right? And I say, what happened to these temples? Well, before the Meiji Restoration and the Shinbutsu Bundi and uh, Haibutsu Kishaku, a lot of Shinto shrines now were actually Buddhist temples. So Sumiyoshi Taisha was a Buddhist temple. Well, at least there was a Jinguji that controlled the, mm, the, the, the Taisha. Kompira was a Tendai temple um, in, in Shikoku, right? Hakozaki Hachimangu uh, was also controlled by, uh, by a Buddhist temple. Tsurugaoka Hachimangu, of course, that was also a Buddhist temple. And so far, um, and so more. So many, uh, so many of what we now consider as Shinto shrines and have a particular relation to the sea were in fact either Buddhist temples or they were controlled by Buddhist temples. So Buddhism did have this strong connection to the sea that we don't see today in Japan anymore, because again, Buddhist temples have been separated from the Shinto shrines and they are located either on big cities or on mountains. So again, this is another change in the history of Japanese religion, but it's also changing the geography of, of the sacred, let's say, that has made, uh, has made it difficult for us to see this particular connection between the sacred religion and the sea in Japan. Other examples, Shitennoji in Osaka, of course, that was in near Naniwa Harbor, right? And that was in the middle of the city, but that was really by the beach when it was built by Shotoku Taishi many centuries ago. Uh, Munakata Shrine itself had the Jinguji uh, from which it was separated. Uh, it's not clear to me why. I think in the Edo period already, but you know, there was this close connection to the Buddhist temple that uh, the Buddhist temple is still there now, but Munakata uh, Taisha is completely independent from it anymore. So again, uh, all these connections, I think, that were there in the past and they are no longer there, uh, are to me very interesting to explore and to see the complexity of these um, religious beliefs and rituals in pre-modern times, when all of these different influences and different components were together. Right, so you have the Buddhist component, the Shinto component, you have local traditions, and then you have, again, the sea out there. So, 
a question that you know comes up when we talk about these things is that well you know you talk about see the role of the sea and religion but are there any specific sea-based religious traditions right because again if you talk about the yamabushi they go to the mountains and they do specific things on the mountains that they cannot do anywhere else right so there is a clear connection there between a religious system shugendo and the mountain right if you are in a village uh, making you know producing rice there is an agricultural cycle there with specific rituals that are connected to the development of rice, right? So you see a connection there between the shrine in the village and, and, and the place where it is built. How about the sea? Are there any particular religious things that you can only do at the sea and not somewhere else? So I think it really depends on how you look at things, right? Um, for example, in Japan, many places in Japan, there is this tradition that on the first day of the of the of the year of Shogatsu, people go to the beach and swim, even if it's if it's terribly cold, right? That seems to be something that they do for fun. But in many places, that is related to some particular Shinto rituals in those in those particular places. So that, in a way, is a way to celebrate the new year, and you can only do it at the sea. You cannot do it on the mountain. So this is something that is shows a deep connection between those communities, those people, and the sea. There are, next, you know, there are both construction rituals. Uh, a lot of these uh, in traditional Japan, but even today, when people make boats, um, sometimes they invite a kanushi-san or they invite somebody and to, to, to um, how do you call it, during the building process, because again, building a boat is something that is very important. In, especially in traditional in pre-modern Japan, right? It's not something that anybody could make. And, and the boat is very important because again, the livelihood of many people depended on it and the, the boat must be well built and the boat must be protected by the gods because if it is not, then it goes down, it goes under and people die. So uh, building a boat was a very important process and that required the intervention of gods or spirits. And that's why there is a series of rituals that were you know implemented performed when when boats were built and again you can only do that in a boat um some scholars have pointed to the similarities between the rituals for building a boat and for building a house in in pre-modern japan so so that is there but again the boats have their own specificity there are rituals for fishing in which uh, Buddhas or Kami are invoked, involved, you know, for the, for the protection of the activity itself. And again, that is for fishing. It's not for climbing a mountain or for growing rice. So seafaring rituals, there are all kinds of things that both, like sailors, for example, did when they were sailing on the ocean. One, one interesting phenomenon is Tomohi Gongen, you know, is this... Uh, this uh, light apparition that you know appears on the sea or is reported to appear on the sea and there are many stories from the Edo period about that and this phenomenon Tomohi is called the Gongen right it's an avatar it's like um, it's like a god right it's a manifestation of a Buddha on you know, uh, on this earth in in Munakata for example there is the Miyaresai and those are boats that go you know, at sea towards uh, Okinoshima. And again, this is something that you can only do at, the, uh, you know, at sea, you cannot do it somewhere else. Then we have the Funadama Sama, for example, right? The spirits protecting the boats. We have all these myths and legends about the Karabune, carrying the Shichifukujin to, 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 to shore. So again, this is uh, something else that is also related to deeply connected to the sea. And again, cannot be really conceived somewhere else. So I think that if we look at all of these, and I'm sure that there are many more, you know, if you look at the coastal areas of Japan, I think that there is a significant body of beliefs and practices that are related to the sea. And we, today, we don't consider them as part of any particular religious system. In fact, they're not really Buddhist, they are not really Shinto, they're just, you know, part of folk religion, as it is called. But still, it, it, these are important ways in which a lot of people throughout Japan interacted with the sea and with the sacred. So I think it is important to pay attention to these uh, maybe smaller phenomena. These are not like large rituals at the large temple, but still a lot of people are involved in them and they are important to, to, to understand 
this particular aspect of, of Japanese culture, I believe. Um, now, let's take a different look at the what I call the pantheon of the sea. Because that's the other thing, right? You know, for many of us who live on land, well, most of us live on land, right? <laughs> they go to the beach every once in a while, but, you know, we don't really do anything particular every day, you know, with the beach. The sea is just this vast expanse of water, and there is nothing there, basically, right? <laughs> well, there's some fish inside, but, you know, we don't, we, we cannot even see. But um, if we look at the, again, at, at documents uh, from ancient from from pre-modern Japan right from the Middle Ages from uh, from the Tokugawa period and so forth we get a very very different image and again it also depends on the kind of documents we look at right when we do the history of Japanese religion we normally focus on documents written by the court by the large temples and those were in big cities they were in Kyoto they were in Nara they were in Edo if you look at documents written by other people on, on the coastal areas of Japan, again, <laughs> the, the picture is very different. So, for example, something that comes up from these documents is that the sea is full of divine beings. There are sea gods, there are divine fish, ghosts, spirits, all kinds of beings live in the sea so it's not that if the sea is empty the, the sea is full of sacredness <laughs> from that particular perspective so for example there are sea deities here there's ebisu kompira which is now called kotohira but kompira is the old name uh, benzaiten uh, which is a sea goddess from india there's maso also called sebo in uh, in kyushu in particular um, which is a chinese sea goddess right Empress Jingu is also worshipped as part of the Hachiman triad. So again, she's an empress, but she's also, well, Hachiman is also Ojin Tenno, right? So, but but it, she is deeply related to the sea. And uh, and and again, is part of the of the cult of the worship of, of Hachiman. And then there are plenty of dragons, which in Japan, the dragons live in the sea, right? In in, in water. They're not like in China where the dragons fly. Or in Europe, where the dragons live under, you know, underground. In Japan, the dragons are sea animals, and that's because they come to Japan from India uh, through Buddhism. And so, uh, so, but you can see how many important gods are related to the sea. Um, this is a beautiful image. It's the, it's the map of Japan's earthquakes. Um, uh, you see that. So the, the things there in the middle, that is Japan with the 66 provinces of traditional Japan. And that's surrounded by a huge dragon. And um, and these little, you know, these things here, which represent kind of the scales of the of the Uroko, right? Of the of the of the dragon, these are records of earthquakes that happened here and there <laughs> in Japan. And this is a, is a kind of a sword that is placed here on the head to keep it down so that it doesn't move. And um, so again, dragons are also related to earthquakes in traditional Japan. But it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, the Japanese or some Japanese at this time, imagine Japan as literally surrounded by a huge dragon. So again, the fish, um, the sea is not empty, but again, it's full of uh, all kinds of things that determine our lives. To an extent. Um, another aspect which for us contemporary people uh, is probably a little alien, a little strange to understand, is the fact that um, certain sea animals had uh, also had a divine symbolism. Pretty much like, I don't know, uh, the dove is the god Hachiman, or the deer is um, the god of Kaska, Taisha or you know, other uh, divine animals like that, um, sea animals also have this kind of divine power. Whales, for sure, right? Whales are, in many places of Japan, were considered um, emanations, right? Incarnations of the god Ebisu. Dolphins also were considered, in some places, like messengers 
of uh, some god, Benzaiten in particular, I see. Sea turtles are also mediators, right, between land and the bottom of the sea, like Urashima Taro, you know, the legend. And so again, these are kind of animals. They're not really, really like regular animals. They have something super, some kind of superpower, let's call it. Uh, to them. Salmon is also a divine uh, messenger. In, in Fukuoka prefecture, there is a sake jinja, right, where, where a salmon is worshipped as, as a divine as a divine being. And catfish, of course, right, namazu, is, um, is traditionally, well, in the Edo period in particular, associated with, uh, with earthquakes and, and the control thereof. So, um, again, these are not just, at least in the imagination of pre-modern Japanese people, these were not just regular fishes or animals, but they were, again, divine entities that required a particular attention. So it was possible to catch, you know, to hunt the whales and, and the dolphins and all of these, and people were able to eat them and use them, but not always, not all the time, not everywhere. And even when it was possible to catch them, Whaling, like hoge, right? Whaling was a, was a specific and ritually controlled activity. And in many villages of Japan, whaling villages of Japan, uh, there are cemeteries for, uh, for whales. Because people acknowledge that the whale is not just any fish, any regular animal. It's a special being that, that brings all kinds of things to this world for us. Here I have a couple of images. Uh, whaling in the Edo period. I mean, if if you look at it this way, it's not like today when you have these huge ships like killing the whales, you know, very easily. And the whales have no protection against this huge technology that we use today. In the Edo period, it was like this. Sometimes humans caught the whale. Sometimes the whale won. The humans were kind of, you know, capsized and some died and, and the whale escaped. So it was like a more equitable <laughs> uh, battle, if you if you want. Um, and this other image to the right is uh, the Namazu. So you have um, Ebisu, and then you have the on top, right, the god, and then you have uh, uh, the god of Kashima here trying to control the Namazu. Um, the reason why Ebisu is giving uh, wealth, money to um, to the people is because earthquakes destroy buildings, and therefore uh, carpenters have a lot of work to do so so they 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 prosper so some people some carpenters thought that the the uh, earthquakes were ways from the god from the gods to help them you know uh, prosper so again there is this connection between um sea animals and 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 the lives of the people that are different from the ways we think of them today Let's move on to another group of, of beings that inhabited the sea in pre-modern Japan, yurei and yokai, right? And now again, this is something that kids like, you know, it's, it's like children's stories. But in the Edo period for, for fishing communities, these were serious matters, I think. You know, you have the phantom ships, uh, you have the ghosts of people who died at sea, you have mermen and mermaids like ningyo, right? And And... So this is like sea monsters attacking the sea. This is a uh, um, sea ghost that sometimes appear to you know to 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 sailors. And it's not very clear if it is like just shadows, if it is like shapes of the waves, or if it is real ghosts. Right? Well, all the ghosts are like that. You're never sure that they are there. Right? And other sea animals. Uh, this is a beautiful image. It's Uminobozu by Utagawa Kuniyoshi. It's at night, there is a, like a storm at sea and the boat is in danger and people saw this black shadow there. Is that a ghost? Is that uh, just a shadow? Is that an imagination? We don't know. But uh, but we have a lot of stories about this, right? And, and you can understand, I mean, with the technology that they had in the Edo period, I mean, the boats were dangerous things. And they could not really control the, the, the extreme manifestations of the power of the sea. So it was easy, I think, to imagine that there were some special forces there that humans could not really control except through rituals. Right? Not, not with technology, not, not, not yet, at least. And these are examples of the so-called mer, mer people, Ningyo, right? Which, um, as we can see, they were painted 
but they were also made <laughs> so that people could also see that these things actually existed. Um, now, a lot of these um, things here were made in China uh, through a combination of different animals, but they were sold to Japan and also to the West, actually. You, you see that in, uh, in, in America and Europe as well. Uh, they were sold as, re uh, as if they were real uh, beings. So that kind of, you know, compounded to the to the imagination of the of the richness of life uh, of life at sea. Um, so let's move on to something a little more abstract. No, we have been talking about like historical situations, why the sea has become a little bit invisible in Japan because of a lot of things. Uh, we have been talking about the fact that the sea is actually populated or people in Japan in the past thought that the sea was populated by a lot of this kind of divine beings. Now, let's think about the cosmology of the abyss, of the sea, and the gods who live there. Um, when we think about the cosmology, the, the structure of the universe, right, according to the, to the ancient mythology in Kojiki and Nihon Shoki, people tend to think about um, a vertical cosmology. Let me move on for a second. They think about a vertical cosmology. This is the first thing that comes to mind, right? You have Takamagahara at the top, and that's where the, the kami of the Kojiki uh, live, right? And then you have Akitsushima or many other names, and that is Japan, and that's where the Japanese people, and you have the Kunitsu kami also, by the way, there you have other, other, other beings there. And then underneath, underground, you have Neno Kuni or Yomi no Kuni, and that's normally associated uh, with the dead. Right, so this is a vertical cosmology, it's typical of shamanistic societies, right? You have the humans in the middle, the shaman is able to, or the miko or whoever, you know, does it, is able to communicate with the gods or with the dead uh, under, underneath. Now, this is the most accepted cosmology. Uh, this is the first thing that comes to mind, I think, today. But if we look at the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki, this is not the only cosmology that exists. There is another one which is also horizontal and it's based on the extension of the sea. Not so much of the plains, because in Japan, as you know, especially in Kyushu, where a lot of these legends originated in ancient Japan, there aren't many large, you know, plains. You know, they're just valleys or some plains, but not, not, not extensive ones. So the the first thing that comes to mind when people thought about you know horizontality was really the sea. And so this is the, the cosmology that again appears in horizontal cosmology from the Kojiki. There's Japan at the middle, at the center, of course, surrounded by the sea. And to the west, there is Kara, which is written with different kanji. Uh, sometimes even the kanji of Korea, uh, Kankoku, the, the kan, right? And that's Asia, basically, right? And then to the east of Japan, there is the land of Tokoyo, which is some kind of other world. And um, and there is communication between these two different realms uh, surrounding Japan from across the sea. So so the sea does play an important role here as a, at least as a mediator, right, between Japan and the other world. Now in Japan, that's interesting because the other world can be ikai, like kara, or takai, right, like the invisible world. But but still, there is some kind of a continuity in the sense that it is not this world. And uh, these two cosmologies can be combined, right? So you have Kara, the sea, so that's Japan, the sea, Kara here and Tokoyo there. And of course, verticality, in terms of verticality, there is Takamagahara at the top and Yomi no Kuni at the bottom. And there is communication among all these different realms. But again, people and scholars in particular have focused on this one and kind of neglected this other one, I think. And that's why the sea has become a little less important and a little less visible. Um, now, these cosmologies, these two different models, right, the vertical and the horizontal cosmology are also applicable to ancient gods. For example, if you look at two sea gods, and again, Sea gods are really some of the most ancient gods mentioned in the mythologies. 
they're not something marginal or something. They're really, really important. I mean, Watatsumi and Sumiyoshi and Munakata are really, really important in the early cosmology, in the early mythology of Japan. So if you look at Sumiyoshi and Watatsumi, these two, these two gods are vertical, but they don't go from here up. Like, um, I don't know, if you think about like a, like a temple, you have the, the main G, the main temple here, and then you have the Okuno In at the top of the mountain. Or if you think about a shrine, you have the Jinja here and the Okuno Miya on the mountain, right? So they go from the, from the, from the ground up. Here they go from the sea level down. It's kind of an inverted uh, verticality, which to me is very interesting because, again, this is only applicable to the sea. It cannot be used any other way. I have never seen a god that from earth, you know, on the ground that goes down. It might exist. I never heard of it. So Sumiyoshi, for example, there is, again, the god. So Sumiyoshi and Watatsumi are triple entities. It's not just one god. There are three different gods, and it's not very clear how they interact with each other. But there is a Mikoto of the surface, no Uatsu, right, of the Ue, of the Omote. There is the Mikoto of the middle part of the sea, and the Mikoto of the Soko, of the bottom of the sea. Same for Watatsumi, right? You have, uh, well, in this case, the kanji are different, but it's really Ue, Naka, and Soko. Which, this is really unique to this type of, of medieval god. Now, if we look at Munakata, that is different, because this is really horizontal, and it's really based on the sea. So you have Hetsunomiya, which is really the center of the cult, right? Because that is the main shrine, and that's where people normally go, also in the past. Then you have the Nakatsumiya, which is in uh, Oshima Island in the middle, right? And then you have Okitsumiya in Okinoshima, which is far, far away and where people now cannot go. And even in the past, it's not very... Really, I mean, people did go there because they brought all the objects there, right? So some people did go, but uh, only for particular purposes, I think, right? You know, it was not just visiting the island for uh, to do a picnic or something. You know, they, go, they went there for ritual, uh, religious, sacred purposes. So again, this is another ancient god, it's an ancient sea god, but the cosmology reflects the sea equally, but horizontally, whereas the two other gods reflect the structure of the sea, but vertically going down. So uh, what can we say about Munakata? So, and the sea in general, right? So there are three different aspects of the sacred, I think. You have um, Hetsumiya, which is near the profane world, right? Is on land, near the, the, the settlement, near the town. And then you have the space in between, you know, the Nakatsumiya, which is this island, which, uh, um, which is not really the mainland and it's not really the, 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 the deep sea. And then you have the most sacred place, Okitsumiya, Okinoshima, which at the same time, these are three different areas of the sea. And I think that this is also related to fishing because what you can fish near the coast is different from what you can see, what you can fish um, uh, you know, from the deep sea. And it's also related to seafaring, right? Because if you go by boat along the coast is one thing, but if you cross the sea to go towards Korea or China, that is a very different thing. And the technology and the boats and the knowledge that are required are different, especially, I mean, in pre-modern Japan. So, again, this structure of the three gods, of Murakata in particular, really tell us something about how ancient people envisioned the sacred, right? So there's something that is close to the profane, something in between, and something that is really far away, almost unreachable, still reachable, but not to everybody all the time and very far away from the world of humans. So I think that this kind of structure of the divine is really, really interesting. And that exists also in other parts of Japan. For example, Oki and Oku, they seem to be cognate words. They seem to be words that were related in ancient Japanese. Now, Oku is uh, used normally used on land and Oki is used on the sea. But the idea is pretty much the same, that there is something at the omote, right at the entrance, and something very important at the, at the far end. 
And this could be the far end inside the house, but it could also be the far end on the mountain. Um, many people think that the model of the mountain or the model of the house is the fundamental model of uh, the cosmology of the sacred. I would like to think that perhaps the sea is the fundamental model of sacred space in Japan rather than the, so, I, I mean, I don't know, right? I mean, we, we don't really know, but given the elaborate nature uh, with which the sea deities are described in Kojiki and Nihon Shoki, like, like I mentioned before, and the fact that something similar is not really, as far as I know, is not really present for any other deities until much later, it is possible that the sea was really the, the primary place of the of the divinity in Japan, and that structure was later then applied to land and the mountains. This is just my thought, but again, I I, I really don't know. I have no proofs about that. Even even so, even if that is not true, still I think it's really interesting that through the sea we can we can take a look at the deeper structure of how many Japanese people imagined the sacred world in Japan. I'm almost done. I have a couple of other slides that I would like to share. But since we were we have been talking about the sea as a primary or as an important, let's put it this way, important model for a sacred space, there are three examples that I would like to bring uh, to, to kind of explain what I have in mind here. And these are very different examples from very different uh, aspects of Japanese religiosity. One is the great purifi uh, purification ceremony, the Oharae you know, the most important Shinto uh, ceremony. The other one is the treasure boats, the Takarabune that I mentioned before. And the third one is the boat spirits, the Funadama, which I also mentioned before. Now, um, go here. So there are three images here. Um, this is on, on the left here. It's an image that I took from a, a late uh, Kokugaku uh, text. I think it's, sorry, uh, I don't, uh, Oh, I'm blanking. I think it's from Hirata Tane or, or some of his, of his disciples. And you see that this is uh, the earth, this is the sun, and this is the moon. And this is how the Oharae takes place. So the impurities from land, from Japan, are swept away by the wind from the mountains down to the rivers, to the towns, you know, to the fields. And the rivers take these impurities to the sea. And where you find different deities, uh, Seoritsu Hime, uh, Ahiaki Tsuhime, Kefuki, Donushi, and Hayasasura Hime. These four deities take away the, the pollution to the sea and inside the sea, and even they swallow it. Uh, they eat it so that, you know, it's disposed of. And this is how they imagined. So uh, authors in the Edo period, especially Kokugaksha, they were imagining this big vortex, this um, is like a uzu in the sea, that is kind of collecting the impurities and 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 bringing them down to the bottom of the ocean. Again, the soko, you know, the, that we have discussed before. So again, this is something similar to to the cosmology that I mentioned before, right? You have something that takes place on land is taken to the sea, and then from the sea is taken to the bottom of the sea. Is a combination of the two cosmologies that I described. And uh, and I think it's quite interesting. I guess when people do the Oharae today, they don't really think about all these implications. They just do the ceremony because it's a, it's a very important one. But but the sea really does a, play an important function in that ceremony. And, and also the sea as a place where all of these things happen and are purified. Now, the treasure boats here, um, these have a long history. I mean, the, the, uh, it's not very clear, but it's something that starts in the Muromachi period, apparently. And um, they carry gifts, precious gifts from beyond the sea. So in that sense, are similar to cargo cults. You know, what the anthropologists call cargo cults, right? When you have these big containers coming from beyond the island, take, you know, bringing wealth, uh, like an enormous amount of wealth. Um. See, I've been thinking, you know, a ship like that, what kind of wealth can it, can it carry? We have to put again, uh, again, we have to put this in context. In the Edo period, you know, boat by trade by boat, especially international trade, right, from across the sea, they were only trading the most expensive items on earth. 
they were not carrying bo I mean, rice or uh, they were carrying spices. They were carrying like uh, carpets from uh, from India. They were carrying very very expensive things. And so a boat, even like a smaller boat, like the one the boat that the Dutch brought to Nagasaki, those were incredibly valuable, incredibly expensive. They could make the fortune of of uh, of a lot of people. Or or. Or a lot of people could lose everything, right? If the if the ship sank, so so this I think is what people had in mind. We also have to um, think about at the time in which the Takarabune begin to the idea, right, of Takarabune begins to circulate, is the time in which the Chinese Ming uh, Admiral Zheng He had traveled from China all the way to Ar India, Arabia, and Africa. And brought back to China all these huge, you know, like treasures. The boats of Admiral Chang He in Chinese were called the Takarabune. The kanji is slightly different, but uh, but it's um, it's Hosen, basically. <laughs> so again, there must be some connection there. People in Japan knew about you know about this this magic trip, you know, to 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 the far end of of the world, and the enormous wealth that came from you know across the sea. So all of these things, like real things, imaginary things, you know, kind of came together into this, into this. Um, but again, the sea becomes a mediator, is a space where a lot of things are possible. There's a lot of danger, but also a lot of possibility. And the boats are really what makes the mediation possible, because we cannot go across the sea without a boat. And that's why the boats have this particular status as a particularly charged sacred objects and that's why there are funadama in them um if you look at the at the funadama itself funadama is a multiple is a complex object so you have these two figurines man and woman those are that's uh, the continuity of the family is prosperity right you have the dice randomness because you're never sure right if you're going to catch the fish or not if we, if the boat sinks or not so there is this kind of challenge you know the chance you have money you know if you if you're lucky you you prosper and so <laughs> and you have grains of rice which again is food and 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 prosperity so these are all things that help um that signify you know the role of the boat the crucial role of the boat which is really important for all kinds of things in human life but it's also something that is mediated through a liminal space, uh, like a marginal space, like the sea, a marginal space which is imbued, you know, in, with with the sacredness, with divinity. This is how I I, I think of it. So, just a few words by way of conclusion. So, what what is this kind of sea and the sacred? Well, it's fluid, obviously, right? It's a network of uh, places and ideas that move across, you know, regions and places. It's fluid because it changes. It's elusive. It's very hard to see. You know, there aren't many big texts. You don't have like a Kukai of the sea or Dogen of the sea. You know, you don't have this big or Shindan. You don't have these big names that talk about the sea because you don't have major centers there. But uh, but you have a lot of imaginations and you have a lot of practical knowledge about how to deal with the sea, how to catch fish and how to bring it to the table all over Japan, which is really, really important because without fish, I mean, it's hard to imagine traditional Japanese food, right? So the sea is not an empty space, but a living environment full, full of meaning and full of sacredness. It's also, I would say, a different type of Japanese religions, which is not based on the main cities, is not based on the mountains, is not based on large temples, but is based on small communities and on different types of rituals that we are not really aware of. How about Munakata? Well, Munakata is typical of this religion, right? It's a model for the kami and the sea as a model of sacred space, like we discussed. Which again, Munakata again is there in in Kyushu, right? But uh, but you have branches of Munakata through Benzaiten in many parts of Japan. So um, 
it would be interesting to do an extensive study of this and see the cosmology of the different branches of Munakata across many parts of Japan to see if it is the same, to see if it changed and if changed, why, right? So I also think that it's important to pay more attention to, to local communities in Japan and their traditions. You know, there is a lot of talk in Japan about machizukuri, right? You know, the revitalization of small communities. But I think that this is important. You know, machizukuri, to me at least, is not just building a new museum or building a new bunka center. It's really something about paying attention and, and, and what can I say, giving value to these long, long traditions um, that are really, really full of meaning and are also still meaningful today, I think. I don't know, maybe we don't believe that the dolphins are divine, we don't believe in the kind, I don't know. But still, there is an important message there, right, in terms of communication between humans and the sea, humans and nature, humans and the fish. And, uh, and this is a message that is important. And I, th I think that this should be at the center of any attempts at Machizukuri. In, in, in Japan today, in, in these little communities. I think they should, they're not little, they're important. So this is what I would like to, to say. And this is how I would like to conclude my uh, talk today. Thank you all very much for your kind attention, you know, for listening to me uh, for such a long time. Thank you. <laughs>